Today on Ancient DOS Games, we're doing Thor's Hammer, and this is an interesting game simply because I never really heard of it. Like, I mean, I came across it online when I was looking through the RGB Classic Games website just for stuff to review. I had never heard of it, and it came out in 95, and it's like, this is the kind of game I should have heard of. So I was thinking to myself, you know, try downloading it, give it a go, see why I never heard of it. And after playing through the entire game, I'm pretty sure I know why I never heard of it. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Let's take a look at the game stats. Thor's Hammer was developed by Escape Programming and published by MVP Software in 1995. It's a one-player first-person adventure sporting VGA 320x200 256 color graphics and Sound Blaster sound. And as for its release date, as of July 2009, this game's been freeware. You can download the full version easily from the RGB Classics website at www.classicdosgames.com. Yeah, very simple game stats for once. So to be fair, there isn't actually a lot of things wrong with this game. The graphics look fairly decent, especially for considering the time the game came out. And the graphics are actually pretty colorful, too. And the music quality is okay. The sound effects are... they, they work. They're, they're not the best, but you, they could do a lot worse than them as well. So really, it's not the graphics or the presentation or anything like that. It's the gameplay. The gameplay is where this game suffers, and before we get into too many details, let's just talk about two particular aspects of the gameplay that really needed to be worked on. Firstly, there's melee attack accuracy. The thing is that in most first-person games, when you attack an enemy, you kind of expect your attack to actually hit them, especially if you're aiming properly and are within the correct striking range. But this game plays sort of like an RPG in that your attacks can arbitrarily miss due to a random chance. So that means you can attack an enemy like five or six times, be within perfect striking range to do so, facing right at them, and you'll miss every one of those times. It's an extremely frustrating aspect of a game that plays in first person. That's the kind of logic you would expect in a strategy type game or in a turn based game. It doesn't work well for a game like this that happens in real time from a first person perspective. And that actually leads into the second issue that this game has with gameplay, and that's the fact that it doesn't understand the whole concept of risk reward. Like, I mean, the idea is, with risk-reward, that the riskier something is, the greater the reward should be for actually accomplishing it successfully. But there's no such thing in this game. None of the enemies drop anything when you kill them, so it's like, what's the point of killing them? I mean, certain enemies do trigger certain events when you kill them, but for the most part, the enemies are just there to get in your way. So it's actually more beneficial in a lot of circumstances to just run away from the enemies rather than try and kill them. So with no reason to actually kill the enemies, and with such a really lousy way for attacking enemies with your melee weapon, you're going to be running away a lot. And what fun is a game where you're running from your enemies instead of attacking them? Granted, you know, that's, those two aspects of the gameplay are really the only things wrong with this game. For the rest of it, it's actually fairly decent. 
Now some of you might notice that the game is actually titled the Thor's Hammer Trilogy, and this is because the game was separated into three chapters, much like a lot of shareware games at the time. Or not so much chapters, they call them episodes, and the three episodes are the trial, the journey, and the battle. And in the first episode, which would be the original shareware episode that you would get the full complete episode of, you have this sort of hub world that you go to, and you just, you talk to different people in the town, you get a quest, you go do the quest, return to the town, get yourself healed up, and go do the next quest. But then the later episodes, episode two and three, you don't have a sort of hub like that. You start from one point, and you're just journeying along to get to the end point. And in the second episode, it's to journey journey towards the guy who has Thor's hammer that you have to get from him, and then the entirety of episode 3 you're using Thor's hammer to go after this big evil wizard thing. And it's interesting to note that this progress that you make doesn't actually get saved between the different episodes. Each episode is its own self-contained entity, and if you end one episode missing some of the items that were in it, then you start the next episode with everything you would have missed and all the other items you picked up. So that kind of makes it interesting too because I kind of missed some things while I was going through this game. When I was going through the first episode I missed one of the throwing axes, so I started the second episode with one more throwing axe than I expected. And then when I was going through the second episode I completely missed one of the magic spells, so I started the third episode with that missing spell. Granted the spell I missed wasn't actually that great, so it's like... I don't know. The game does actually have quite a variety of things you can pick up. Like, I mean, there's different weapons you can pick up. Most of them are axes. In fact, all of them are axes except for Thor's hammer. And again, they don't really make that much of a difference because the minimum amount of damage any of the weapons in this game do, including Thor's hammer, is not enough to defeat even the weakest enemies. So even once you have Thor's hammer, sometimes it can take two hits to take down just a bat or an orc. So I, that's kind of... Yeah, it's kind of lame, but you do get armors as well, and the armors reduce damage to you by an extremely minuscule amount. So actually, a lot of the items in this game seem pretty useless, though there are some that aren't useless. Like, there's these pendants you can pick up for your throwing axes, which make your throwing axes give, like, you know, gives them a fire enchantment or gives them a lightning enchantment. And then, of course, there's the throwing axes themselves. And that is one interesting aspect of this game, is the throwing axes that you get. Once you find a throwing axe, you're pretty much guaranteed to keep it through the rest of the game. But the thing is that the throwing axes, when you throw them and they hit an enemy, you have to run over and pick that axe up before you can use it again. So obviously, as you progress through the game, you get multiple throwing axes. But what's interesting about this is that sometimes you can throw a throwing axe and you'll accidentally throw it over a pool of water and be unable to get, get it back or anything. So when this happens, you'll find these guys throughout, scattered through the game, like some will be in a town or some will just be standing in a random spot or trapped in a dungeon, and they basically say they're, go they're preparing for a journey and don't want to be disturbed. But if you disturb them when you don't have any of your throwing axes or just missing one of them, they give you those axes back. Which is kind of weird when you consider you can throw your throwing axe just to the side of you, speak to the guy, and he says he found it on a journey and gives it back to you. You must take some pretty quick journeys. And then of course you have your magic spells, and as you can see there's five different spells you can get through the course of the game, but you're probably not going to be using them too much, especially the first two spells, Fireball and Air Blast, because they're your direct attack spells, but they don't really do that much damage, and they use a lot of magic power. So really, it's the other three spells, the last three spells in that list, that you're going to be using the most often. The third spell in the list there is Kablooey, and you don't actually get it until closer to the end of the game. And basically what it is, is it's a kill everything spell. And you get all the enemies around you, you cast Kablooey, everything around you dies. And it doesn't actually work that well against the tougher enemies, but against the weaker enemies, you just get a group of them around you and you cast that spell and you don't have to worry about them anymore. Of course, the spell uses an extremely large amount of magic, but, you know, just keep your magic saved up and you'll be fine. And then you have your heal spell. And the heal spell you actually find after the fireball spell, making it the second spell you find. So, yeah, the spells are all over the place on that menu there. The heal spell, as you would imagine, just heals your health. And I find it's good to use the heal spell to keep your health and magic balanced, because you tend to find health and magic potions, even the maximum potions, in equal quantities. Not perfectly equal, but equal enough that they're going to be relatively similar through the course of the game. 
And then there's the Time Stop spell. The Time Stop spell is interesting because when you use it, everything stops moving, including projectiles and even your own projectiles like throwing axes or magic. And while time is stopped, you can still move around, but you can't actually hurt anything. So the idea of using Time Stop is not so that you can damage things and then move on. The idea of using Time Stop is either to prepare yourself for a massive attack against something by stopping time and just getting a whole bunch of throwing axes moving towards a single target or something, or to use it to escape, because while time is stopped, the enemies aren't going to follow you and you can get on by them. Now the Time Stop spell does use a lot of magic as well, so you want to be pretty careful about how often you use it, but for the most part it can be useful in the right circumstances. Just just don't rely on it as a form of attack, unless you're up against the final boss where you'll pretty much have to use Time Stop if you want any chance of destroying it. Now because the game is freeware now, I'm not going to really go too much into the story or spoil anything, so instead I'm just going to give some general tips for anybody who wants to try this game. And the first big tip I can give is to try and avoid using your melee attack as much as possible. It's unreliable, it doesn't do that much more damage than your main throwing axe attack. So use your throwing axes instead when you can, because they're a lot more effective. And this means you also need to get used to the way projectiles work in this game, in terms of hit detection. You see, the hit detection is based on the grid units that something is occupying. Basically, what particular tiles on the grid that you're touching. And this counts for any of the enemies, or even for yourself, or also for the projectiles. And what this means is that if you happen to be touching like uh, just the edge of a particular grid tile, and something that's coming by you on that same side touches the opposite edge of that grid tile, it actually counts as an impact with you. So if a projectile is doing that, then the projectile hits you even though you're still almost a full space away from it. This makes for some really awkward hit detection in this game, and it means that if you want to dodge something, you gotta really dodge it. You can't just dodge it by a little. You gotta be at least one full tile away or it is going to hit you. And this actually also counts for the enemies. So you can use this to your advantage to spread your throwing axes over a certain area so that you're guaranteed to hit some of the enemies. And of course this also means that if you're trying to throw something down a narrow corridor or something, it could touch the edges of the corridor really easily. So yeah, the hit detection is kind of messed up in this game, but do what you can with it because there are ways to take advantage of it. Another good tip I can give you guys is that you want to keep multiple saves of your game because it is actually possible to end up into situations where you cannot proceed any further. And this can be really annoying, especially like if you have like just one save game going and you save your game and then you realize you need the Kablooey spell to progress but you don't have the magic for it and there's no magic potions left in the area and you can't go back. Yeah, situations like that are going to haunt you. So. Granted, they are very few and far between, but they can happen, and there's even glitches in the game that can actually create solid objects that are invisible, out of just nothing, sort of. I was prevented from getting down a corridor once because of something like this, and I was unable to progress. So the thing is, you really need to keep multiple saves just in case stuff like this happens. And my last tip falls back on that old axiom, he who lives to run away lives to fight another day because in this game, there's virtually no reward for killing the enemies, so when you can, stay away from them, or just escape combat entirely. The enemies can drain your health, they can drain your magic, because you have, end up using magic against them, and health and magic power-ups in this game, they're pretty common, but they only restore tiny amounts of your health and magic. So, there's not enough of it to really bring yourself back up if you take any serious damage which means fighting the enemies is pretty much useless. Avoid combat if you can, only fight the enemies if you absolutely have to. Anyways, let's talk about getting this game working in DOSBox. First thing I'm going to note is that you have to manually set the core to dynamic mode. If you leave the core on the auto setting, your frame rate is going to really suffer when you try to play this game. And and the only thing is though that even if you set it to dynamic, this is one of the few games I know of where the max, auto, and fixed cycle settings don't work properly. Granted, the problems are different for each of them. If you set max or auto, the gameplay will be kind of erratic in the speed, like I mean sometimes it'll be turning and it will suddenly jerk to the side a little faster. So 
Max or auto settings have problems with the gameplay in general, whereas if you use a fixed cycles count, what ends up happening is that the story sequences, they slow down and the music gets all funky and everything. Well, not funky, it's like, it's like it stutters. So you either have to deal with jerky gameplay or stuttering story sequences. And I say, go for the stu stuttering story sequences. That's almost a tongue twister. It's, and the fixed cycles count I recommend using is 60,000. 60,000. If your computer can handle it, great. If it can't, then use a slower setting because all using a slower setting really means is that you'll have a lower frame rate overall. And the frame rate at 60,000 is pretty good. And of course, keep the graphics filters off because it's a 3D game and 3D games generally don't benefit from the graphics filters much. But there is one advanced thing you can do with this game if you happen to have some insight into dealing with stuff like this. If you go to the RGB Classics website and you try to download the registered version of Thor's Hammer, you'll note that it's version 1.0. Yet on that same website, you can find the shareware version 1.1. Now, one thing I've noticed is that if you take the executable file Thor.exe from the shareware version and put it over top of the executable file for the registered version, it still works perfectly fine and helps you get around some of those bugs that are in the, the 1.0 version of the game. The only catch with doing this is that when you actually beat the first episode, it'll drop you back to DOS prompt or quit the game entirely. So. You know, if you're willing to live with that, then this is a good thing to do to get around some of the bugs. Like that one right there. Yeah, that actually did honestly happen. That is not me fooling around with anything. So yeah, the game has some minor issues. Anyways, that's enough for this episode. Stay tuned for episode 15 of Ancient DOS Games, where I'm going to be covering a Tutankham clone. Because there were a bunch of those particular games, but this particular one uses high-resolution EGA graphics. You know what game I'm talking about? Send your guesses to adg at pixelships.com, and stay tuned for the next episode to see if you got it right.